I just wanted to see how everybody's doing. Uh, is everybody okay with uh, with what we are uh, covering? Uh, do you are you comfortable? Is it getting too heavy? Uh, um, go ahead, Samuel Shrikumar. I see different hands raised. Okay, let me hear your thoughts. <laughs> what do you have to say, Samuel? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. So, um, in essence, Pastor, what we are saying is uh, the Big Bang um, and the Earth um, all happened in one single day. In Genesis That's, 1 1. Mm -hmm. In Genesis 1 1. Like, um, all of that happened. So, like, uh, because I think the scientific theory is between Big Bang and the Earth being formed, uh, there is some time gap of some billions mm. of years. And, and it didn't stop there, meaning, you know, even as we speak today, planets are still being formed and, uh, you know, stars are still being born and planets are still being formed. Uh, but uh, when it comes to Earth uh, being formed, uh, from the time where nothing out of matter exists, like nothing existed and suddenly everything existed. That happened in, in a single act, uh, in, in this compressed uh, time. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Th th that's what you're saying, right? Um, and I don't know if my network is acting up, but did, have you addressed, got into the part of the dinosaurs being um, life or not before man uh, and dinosaurs, or, or that's to come? We will do that. Um... So what we do is after we next week after we cover the Big Bang, and uh, just kind of uh, understand, I mean, we just understand what it is and what the Christian response to it. Then we'll take up. Okay, so we've understood uh, evolutionary biology. We've understood cosmos through Big Bang. So how do you answer these questions? Okay. One will be the, uh, you know, like we're saying the fossils and uh, the uh, carbon dating or radio uh, uh, radioactive dating uh, uh, those 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 related questions uh, ha after we speak about evolutionary biology and big bang those questions we'll, we'll put that in the end because then it makes sense uh, once we've gone through it okay okay thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sri Kumar we have a question on the chat as well yeah Sri Kumar Thank you, sir. Sir, um, I just want to know, um, uh, as we, um, as you said that the time, energy, and uh, the matter is matter was compressed, and um, um, but in the Genesis chapter one, Genesis chapter one, um, when we read um, uh, that when God said, "Let there be light." So what? Um, so what was that light? If the if the God has created the stars, um, you know, very uh, after creating everything and after the sun and the moon, he created. Then he created mm. the stars. So what was that light? And uh, my second question is, when the Bible says that the earth was a gulf in darkness, was it uh, really darkness or was it? Uh, was it a spiritual darkness or any any other kind of a darkness? And my third question is: nowhere in the Bible it mentioned that God created water. God created, uh, but the Bible says that the earth was covered with water or engulfed with water. And also nowhere in the Bible it mentions that God created the air. Nowhere in the Bible it says that God created the rock and the mountain. Mm. So. So where it uh, all these things uh, like in the in the in the process of creation, like uh, we have as we said, like there is a six days of creation. So where these things will come up, like uh, the mountain, rocks, waters, air, uh, and uh, because uh, you can see that water was already there before God said, "Let there be light," and uh, water was something which was covered the entire um, the surface of the earth. So how the water was created when um, and um, and there is no record on that. So I just want these three things. Also, I just want to know these things. Three things. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So your first question will be our third question that we're going to answer. That's in the notes. It's like how Teisha asked about the days, 
uh, being, you, you asked that question. So basically what we will see, that's the next question. You know, very often people ask in Genesis exactly, what was this light? Well, to, uh, to understand the past, we go into the future. When you go to Revelation chapter 21 and also chapter 22, you find in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no sun. So it's like, hey, we're back at the beginning. There's no sun. And then you see, where is light? It says, the Lord himself is the light of the earth. So when you go to Revelation 21 and 22, there is no sun. God is the light. So we can say, therefore, you go back to the beginning, Genesis 1, 1. God himself was light. So the light that we talk about there is God. And God can, you know, if he wants to have, uh, God is light. Uh, he was a source of light. He is the source of light. And he will be, to, in the future, there won't be any sun. He will be the light. New heavens and new earth. So we can, therefore, because we have a biblical basis to say it, we can go back to Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and say, hey, this makes perfect sense. You don't need a sun to have light when God is there. So the sun is only an expression of the father of lights. The lights, the stars that we see are only a physical expression of the father of lights, right? So the light in, you know, the first few days when there was no sun was God himself providing whatever light provides to the planets. Um, so the next question uh, you asked about um, um, darkness. Uh, darkness right so when you know we could just say that before god himself caused his his light to bear on the earth physically right uh, so when the, when when god said let there be light verse 3 it's like brightness coming in where is that brightness coming from from god himself so in the absence of that, which is verse 3, before God did verse 3, there was darkness, verse 2, that was the absence of light. So it's physical light. Right? Your third question was water. Well, we can say that in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, when God created the heavens, which is the vast expanse, and the earth, Right, verse one. So when he created the earth, at that time, the earth didn't have the vegetation. It didn't have animal life. It didn't have human life. Uh, the earth had water that covered all of it. So in what form was earth created? When earth was brought into existence, there was land and water and the water enveloped the entire land mass. So it was like a ball surrounded by water. That's what we understand from verse two. And it was created in a void in this space without light uh, on it. But then God caused his presence to bear physical light, which is verse three. And then on day four, God created the lights, the physical stars. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. We will get into that the question later. Thank you, sir. Uh, Rupa, you're welcome. Rupa, you had a question? No, sir. No, sir. Thank you. Okay, I, I just wanted to, you know, ask the class. I, 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 are we all okay? Because I'm, I'm know that not everybody comes from. You know, I just have to tailor it to what we're discussing. I have to tailor it to the class. So, is everyone okay with our discussion so far, Genesis one, and we're kind of getting it into the details. If it's too much, it's okay. If you're comfortable, we'll go on. Okay, just let me know, uh, and we will tailor the content to. Uh, what uh, everybody is comfortable with, okay? Uh, I don't want it to be too hard uh, at the same time. If you're interested, you know, we can uh, get into the details, okay? But just let me know.
So we're going back to where we paused, um, where Genesis 1, yeah. So we were answering this whole issue on, um, uh, was, was it literal six days or not? And I was talking about some of the theories that have been put forward in the Christian community uh, in, try to re in trying to reconcile uh, science and Genesis 1. Okay, so we're just trying to look at each of those theories. So there, there are these three main theories uh, which we're going to look at. Uh, so first one, we talked about the gap theory. Uh, we said that, okay, there's not enough evidence for something like that. And there's a big question is why would God just be sitting around doing nothing for you know, so many billions of years and leave things like that in billions of years? Why would he need to do that? Okay. Uh, second the theory was the day theory, which we started looking at. We said, look, uh, is can we say that the day, the, each of the six days in Genesis one, are uh, could be more than you know a twenty-four hour period? Could it be a thousand years? Could it be seven thousand years? Could it be millions of years? Uh, you know, some Christian scientists uh, who try to reconcile Genesis one with science even say, oh, okay, it's billions of years. Is it right to do that? And what what we are saying is, look, if 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 you if you start doing that, uh, the whole text becomes absurd, right? So first we said that uh, it's very clearly stated. It's a morning and the evening, which is simple language that describes a twenty four hour period. So that's the first thing we said. The second thing is uh, uh, that yeah, so. You know, God na named day and night. So day and night. So if he's calling it day and night, which is right there in the very beginning, that is in verse 5. Okay, verse 5. Genesis 1, 5. So on day 1, on day 1, he called it day and night. So again, it's very simple, plain language that is consistent throughout scripture. So if we interpret verse five, day and night, anything other than 24 hours, then we will have to use it consistently throughout the rest of the Bible. That means everywhere else where the Bible uses the word day, you know, example, if you say the day is 7,000 years or 1 million years, then we have to be consistent because God called it day and you're saying that day is example, one million years. Then everywhere else in the Bible, when it says day, we will have to use that same definition of a day. It would make the rest of the Bible very absurd. Okay, so that's the second reason why we shouldn't change the morning and evening or day and night beyond what we know as a 24 hour period. Now, if you, uh, so this is morning and evening, right? So if, if we change the day and night to something other than a 24 hour period, it just becomes very absurd. Another thing is later on in Exodus, right? When you go to Exodus 20, uh, if you look there, it says, uh, when God introduces this whole thing on the Sabbath, you know, Exodus 20. Again, just I'm just giving you know example of how absurd something like this can become. If you go to Exodus 20, it states very clearly, uh, verse 8. Remember Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your stranger. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, so you look at this passage, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. God is telling man, is commanding man through Moses, of course, you work six days, you rest the seventh day. Because I worked six days and I rested the seventh day. Now, if we go to Genesis 
and start making those six days as whatever, you know, thousands of years or millions of years or whatever we want to do with that in Genesis 1, then you've got to apply the same thing here in Exodus 20 because God has put it together. You know, he's put it together. That means man has to work, you know, whatever. Six days, if you're making it a thousand years every day, he has to work 6,000 years and then wait for the seventh. Is that what it is? No, that's not what God is saying. He's saying, he's talking about the weeks. The week, six days in the week you work, seventh day you rest. And that is what he's applying back to himself. Right? So uh, we must you know, understand because later on it's 20 verse 8 to 11. He's, he's referencing back Genesis 1. And you know, if we change Genesis 1, you have to change Exodus 20. And then it becomes very absurd. It doesn't become practical. It's not correct. You know, another thing, just looking at that is, um, uh, you know, we know that uh, sometimes the word day is, uh, is you know, the, the word day is generic, can be also used in a generic sense in other places. In Genesis 1, it is very explicit. It says morning and evening, or evening and morning, and night and day, or day and night. It's very explicit. But we know the word day can be used also to refer to ages, a, a period of time, an indefinite. Like, for example, the day of the Lord. Yeah, what is it? It's, it's you know, it's the time, sometime in the future, the day of the Lord will come. Uh, so what has happened is just because days is also used as ages or periods of time, context matters. We cannot take that idea that days is used in the Bible to refer to periods of time. In the last days, example, you know, last days. And we understand, you know, Peter standing up and saying, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And we know, okay, it's 2,000 years. Okay, but the context matters. So when Peter said in the last days, he was not referring, last days, he was not referring to 24-hour period. He was talking to about period of time. And that's fine. In that In that case, yes, it's more than a 24-hour period or two 24-hour periods. But the context for us in Genesis 1 1 is given right there. And in the context, it's telling us very clearly morning and evening, day and night. So it would be taking things out of context if we change it to more than 25 period. Another, uh, just, just, just you know, looking at it from various angles, right? So again, if you if we change this to thousand year periods or anything else, millions of years, some people have done, then, you know, you're applying, you know, every day, thousands of years. So what is happening? The waters covered the earth. They were divided. Then vegetation happened thousands of years. Then the sun, moon and stars came to bring in seasons on the earth. So we are saying, you know, you, you know so much time passed before all this took place, which again is, it doesn't seem consistent with the creative process that God would have engaged. It's like saying God is taking so much time to create things. It doesn't seem consistent. And then you kind of extend it there, you know, like I already mentioned earlier, you know, Okay, Adam was made uh, on the sixth day. If you're saying day six was thousand years, you know, whatever time, Adam was thousand years or so 7,000 or one million years old. And after that, Eve was created, you know, because Adam was created, God rested for another day. And then later on in the Garden of Eden, he brought Eve. So, you know, whatever we say times two, you know, if you're saying one day is thousand years, so day six, then day seven out of the thousand years, then sometime later, we don't know exactly when, Eve is created. So Adam must have been between 2000 to whatever, you know, before he met Eve. But then you find later on, 
uh, Seth was born 130 years old, um, uh, you know, by the time of the fall, Genesis 5. So it, it, it immediately you see a contradiction there. Okay, so that's the reason why we do not uh, accept this day theory because a lot of things become out of order when you start looking at it in depth. The last uh, theory that people have put, and uh, and uh, you know, um, I have to admit that uh, many well-known Christian, um, I would say, scientists who are Christians, uh, uh, you know, support this kind of a theory, which they call as a theistic evolution. Um, basically, what they are saying is, God kick-started the process and then let evolution take over, you know. So, you know, for example, when we talk about evolutionary biology, evolutionary biology cannot explain to us, and as you, we will see it in the next chapter, where did the initial prebiotic, that means before life came, those molecules that you need come from? You, know, you need proteins, you need lipids, you need uh, all of the, uh, you know, sort of these molecules to give life. Where did they come from? Secondly, evolutionary biology cannot explain to us where did the intelligence come from? Even for this protein, like we saw last week, for a single protein molecule, the amino acids and coming together with such intelligence and then the encoding of information, which we refer to as the DNA, which then describes the characteristics of the organism. Where did that intelligence come from? I mean, how did these molecules just assemble together so that it could then determine the characteristics of that organism? Evolutionary biology cannot explain that. So what theistic evolution is saying is, well, God gave all of that intelligence. He gave all of that. Or talking about the Big Bang would say, okay, God created the, God was the cause of the Big Bang. He created energy, matter, time, and space. But then he let things stick, go on. You know, things happen over time. And he just is sitting there for billions of years. <laughs> letting things happen. Basically, it's been an attempt to reconcile Genesis 1 with science. But I would say it's, it's a sad attempt. And the problem is we are letting uh, our respect for science become more important than our respect for the Word of God. Now, these are good scientists, okay? I'm not questioning their our scientific ability or capabilities. No, they're, 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 they're respected in their fields. But uh, we cannot let our respect for science override our respect for God's word. But in theistic evolution, that's what they've done. Now, there's the reason is this. There's a very big problem. The problem is we are arriving at a conclusion of overriding what the Bible is saying based on what we know about science today. If we do that today, sometime in the future, maybe you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, if the information in science changes, for instance, you know, they found DNA and uh, protein molecules on fossils. And then they said, oh, no, no, these fossils cannot be millions of years old because you cannot find 
this on a fossil. So maybe our estimation of time was wrong. So this we have to re recalibrate now because we have found something different. So again, the whole issue of dating a fossil changes. So like that, so many things in science is changing. We'll talk about it next week. So the point going back to theistic evolution, the, the big problem is this. If today, based on the information I have from science, I'm redefining what the Bible is saying, tomorrow, or meaning in the future, if my understanding from science changes, am I going to change what the Bible is saying again? That's the problem. So two big problems with theistic evolution. One, we're giving more respect to science than to the Bible. And we're trying to somehow say, uh, you know, everything evolved like the science says, and God just started it and he's then is stood by as a spectator. Second problem is, which, which obviously that's not who God is, that's not the God of the Bible. Secondly, sorry, what we are saying is, today this is our understanding of science, so we will change how we exp explain the word. Does that mean, you know, sometime from now, if your understanding of science changes, you're once again going to change what the Bible is saying? That's a big question, okay? So what are we trying to get at? What I'm trying to say is this. The best thing for us to do is to just to accept Genesis chapter one the way it is. Yes, there are questions, like we are talking about some of these questions. Yes, there are questions, but we can find Bible, or I would say answers that are consistent with the rest of the Bible. We shouldn't come up with answers that are not supported clearly by the rest of scripture. Because then we can get into a whole lot of problems. So, you know, we stay with that. One last question, which I think um, um, Shri Kumar pointed out. So, you know, as we read Genesis 1, we've addressed certain questions. There are some more questions which we'll under, address after we do the Big Bang, you know, like the age of the earth. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, carbon dating and in terms of this whole finding of the fossils, the, the life evidence, so we'll address that. But another com another common question from Genesis 1 is this. We are saying, I mean, as we read Genesis 1, we are saying, hey, verse 3 says there is light, 3 and 4, and there's day and night happening. But, only on day four, sorry, yeah, on day four, which is verse 14, we are seeing the stars being created. And we are seeing seasons, days and years being set in place, meaning the, uh, what we understand as the seasons on the earth. So there was light and there was darkness absence of light but we are seeing seasons signs seasons days and years stars being put up only in day four so the question is where was this light coming from uh, like we saw earlier you know in, in, in where was this light coming from in genesis 1 verse 3 where was it so our question then is, do we need a sun to have light or do we need the stars to have light? Or do we know, is it right to say that God himself was the source of this light? I mean, we know the scripture saying God is light. There is no darkness. And we know that is spiritual. But could God be the source of physical light? Can we see it in scripture? Well, we know that uh, when people had encounters with God, they saw physical light. Uh, Saul on the road to Damascus saw bright physical light shining and he was blinded. We know that. So we know that 
physical light coming from God is possible. But what really is amazing is when you go to Revelation 21, and uh, you look at there. So let's go to Revelation 21. And uh, we can look at verses 22 to 25. Somebody could read that for uh, 22 to 25. Sorry, somebody could read that for us quickly. Revelation 21, 22 to 25, and also 22 verse 5, please. Okay, I'll, I'll read Revelation 21. Uh, Revelation 21, uh, 22 to 25. And I saw no temple in the city, for, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Thank you, sir. Verse 5 of chapter 22. Okay, chapter 22, verse 5. It says, And night will be no more. There will be they will need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. So when you get a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth, that's going way out into the future, it says there's no need for a sun. God's glory becomes the light of the planet, the new earth. And is there life on New Earth? Yeah, people are living on it. There's a river flowing through it. There's a tree also happening there uh, that's bearing fruit. And uh, God is the light of that planet. So, and he's talking about physical light. So, we have scripture that can that's telling us that physical light is possible from the glory of God. So going back to Genesis 1 verse 3 verse 4, we can say that at that time there were no stars, but God gave whatever light was needed, physical light that was needed. And he went about creating the firmament, that means the vast expanse all around the planet. Uh, he went about separating the waters on the earth from the land mass. Then he went about creating the sun, uh, the stars, including big and small lights. That's day four. Then he created sea creatures and bird creatures, sorry, flying creatures, birds. Day five. And then he created creatures on the planet, on the earth. Okay, that is the animals. And he put man. Sorry, before that, there was vegetation also created there. So God did it in that sequence, the way it's described for us in Genesis 1 1. And uh, we just take it as presented for us here. Okay. So I'm going to pause now uh, before we jump jump to the next chapter. I want to just see, uh, you know, we've answered some basic questions that, common questions that come based on Genesis 1. Uh, so Tesha, is that okay? What we, I don't know where Tesh is, uh, about, does it answer your question about, you know, that one day is a thousand years and a thousand years one day. I mean, are you comfortable with the answer? Okay, not sure. Okay. Anyway, um, 
uh, uh, Shri Kumar, uh, were you comfortable with the answer about? Yes, sir. Is that okay? I mean, if you have yes, questions, sir. please ask. Don't hesitate. Uh, yes. This is it's a learning yes, for all yes. of us. No, uh, it was it was clear to me. Sir. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, sir. So don't hesitate, any anyone, don't hesitate to ask questions, you know. Uh, uh, is there, is, is uh, anyone else? Anyone else with any questions? Now, you know, uh, some, in some Christian circles, like I mentioned, uh, there may be uh, uh, a lot of emphasis on, say, the gap theory and the pre-Adamic world. And, you know, in case you've heard that kind of a teaching and you have questions, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong in discussing it. Uh, we can try to answer those things. All right. Okay. If there are no more questions on this, I'm going to go to, I'm going to move over, you know, change a little bit now. So what we've done is we have, um, uh, looked at uh, Genesis 1. So now let's see what does science present to us as the origin of life, okay? So we've so seen this is what the scriptures are telling us. Uh, okay. All right, Genesis 1 and verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Please explain. So... What we can say, so Genesis 1, verse 1. So I'm just answering uh, Avani's question on the chat. Genesis 1, 1 is saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in that creative act of God, the heavens, uh, meaning all, uh, you know, it doesn't state, doesn't use this language, but we are saying all the planetary bodies or the, 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 celestial bodies outside or other than luminary bodies that is stars came into existence so the planets we were the planets as we know it and whatever else is there other than the stars came into existence and god said genesis 1 1 it says when god created right so all this you can imagine all this came in and the earth came in but how did god create the earth or rather, in what form was it? Verse 2 explains. The earth was without form and empty, nothing on it, no life on it. And darkness was on the waters. So you have to imagine, you have this earth planet that is covered by water. So you don't see the hills and the valleys, the mountains. You don't see any of that, right? I'm not saying it's not under the water, but at that point, all you're seeing is you're seeing an earth covered with water. Did it have mountains and valleys and those things at that time? Maybe, or maybe it happened uh, on, you know, day two when, God separated the waters from the earth, right? That's day two, uh, day three, sorry. So maybe the mountains, the hills and the valleys came in on day three, or maybe it was already there, but it was all surrounded by water. So it's just a description of what, it, what things were like in verse two. So there was a physical earth but it was surrounded by water. So you can't tell, you know, you can't tell the form of it because it's all fully surrounded by water and it's dark. That's it. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Any particular question you had on that? Or? What I was thinking was that earth was there without form and void and then God recreated it. That was something I was confused about. So now I'm clear when you explain. Okay. All right. Okay. Fine. Anybody else? Any Sorry, questions? Question. Go ahead. Uh, so in in that like God, 
the earth was was without form and, and void. And some of the scriptures say void is like waste or something. So the question they ask is, uh, how can uh, uh, something that God created can be waste? That's my question. Hmm. Um. Was a form and void waste, right? Let me just quickly look it up. Can we use the word waste here? Uh, just a minute here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it says here emptiness, void, and ruin. It could be ruin. Okay. Now I'm looking at the Hebrew word, bahu, right? It's talking about a, an emptiness, a void, or a ruin. So it doesn't have to be uh, a ruin, but saying uh, emptiness, void, or ruin. So uh, my response to that is, okay, here you have a Hebrew word, which could be in, translated as empty, that means there's nothing on it, void. Again, talking about emptiness. But it can also be used in the context of ruin, something that's uh, laid waste, like you say. So I think the context for us will determine, you know, what should, this, just like everywhere else in scripture, a word can have multiple meanings. And we should just look at what is the context here. I shouldn't use one potential meaning of that word to, you know, to expand on an idea. So what would be the best translation of the word void? Well, it's a translation of that word, Hebrew word. Well, it's empty, it's void. There's, not, there's nothing on it yet. But if I say ruined, I need to understand it as, okay, Again, the sense of ruin means not ruin because there were good things on it before and therefore that those were destroyed, but in the sense of, well, nothing is there. You know? That's how I would respond to it. That it. It was void, empty, nothing on it. But if I start building on that word ruined, uh, you know, as, as some people have done to, to support the gap theory, uh, and therefore, because of that, there was life on it before. Then I'm going into, I'm, I'm bringing up ideas that I cannot necessarily substantiate by other scriptures. You know? So that's the danger. If I, if I just say, hey, that word there, the earth was without form and ruined. Therefore, there must have been life on earth before, between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2. And I go into that, then, well, you know, then we can do anything with words, you know. Okay, that's thank you. Yeah. So, okay. Good. Good questions. Anything else? Pastor, actually, go ahead. Um, anyone, <laughs> Viola, go ahead. Then we can have Mrs. Oliver. Go ahead. Pastor, actually here in the Amplified uh, version, there, I mean, they have explained this word, the tohu bahu as a figure of speech. And it is written, the meaning is that the earth had no clearly discernible features at this point in creation. Mm. But it was essentially just a mass of raw materials. So I, I like here, I think they're trying to explain that... Uh, what it means here is, like, as you mentioned, there was no mountains and valleys. So there's no uh, clear, discernible features at this point in creation. That's mm. what that word uh, is used. It's just a, like a construction of, of figure of speech. That is what it is written here, Pastor. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing that with the class. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Pastor, you said uh, in verse 4, light, I mean, God, it was, uh, you know, uh, the glory of God, that light, God was mm. the light. Then what is that darkness then? So, 
darkness is the absence of light. Light. Okay. So he divided the light and darkness. What did he divide them? So, uh, so we. So God is light. It doesn't mean he is going on and off. He is always light. But out of his glory, he is causing something physical to happen. On the earth, just like we saw in Revelation, he's causing out of his glory, light to be on the new heavens and then the earth. So same thing here we can understand, okay, that light came from God and he caused it to be bright for a certain duration and he caused no light to be for a certain duration. The duration when there was light was called day. The duration when there was no light, he called it as night. So God is causing that on the earth. He doesn't need a sun to do it because he's God. And uh, what he caused on the earth, that light he called as day, the absence of that light, he called it as night. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Yeah. So God himself is not going on and off. <laughs> But what he's causing on the earth out of his own power is what we are saying as day and night. Yeah, because we see very clearly over in Revelation, he doesn't need a sun to have light. Yeah. Yes, Christopher, please go ahead. Um, I think a lot of questions are coming up. It's, it's, it's good. It's 24. And... Um... And in uh, 126, there's a sequence of uh, uh, God creating uh, uh, the animals. And then after that, he uh, is mentioned that uh, you know, he created man. Um, in your notes, you have mentioned that in, in Genesis 2, um, man was created in Genesis 2, man was created before the, um, uh, you know, the animals. I just wanted to understand, uh, you know, it's, where is that? I mean, the sequence uh, has it changed uh, in those two? Um... No, this must be a problem with my notes, not the Bible. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, where is it? My Let's notes. Is... I hope I. Write okay, I'll, I'll check it. I'll check it. But thanks for pointing it out. Sure. Uh, sure. Yes. Man is created before animals. Oh yeah, animals. Well, actually, it was the same day. They were both created on the same day. Right. And let me see. Let me see. Oh, oh, uh, Genesis. Okay, okay. Yeah, I will correct it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Fine. So, uh, well, you can think about these things. We will take questions again next class. So what um, we're going to do now is, um, uh, yeah, we will take a break. Next week, I'm going to, uh, our goal is to cover, you know, uh, how science tells us about the origin of life. You know, today we discuss, okay, what the Bible tells us about the origin of life and some questions on, on it. Good discussion. Next week, science is saying this is how life came. You know, so we look at the evolutionary biology aspect of it. What are the two big questions? Like uh, it's already in your notes, you know, two big questions. And uh, uh, the Big Bang, how they say the origin of the cosmos, how that happened. So we'll try to understand it and try to say, okay, so what is our response to it? And then we'll take up some more questions in relation to these two aspects, which are, I think some people asked today about fossils. So one of the quote unquote evidences for evolution and the evolutionary process is fossils. Even Darwin used that as one of his basis of his arguments. So how do we respond to that and the information coming to us through fossils? Uh, and then how do we respond to the information 
on the age of the universe. I mean, I've already we already discussed it, but you know, when they, when they say, okay, there's all this you know, dating mechanisms, how do we respond to it? So I'm going to try to complete uh, you know all of that next week uh, in in those two hours, and then what we want to do is we want to then move on into other subjects on apologetics, which would be the next immediate subject is the Bible itself. How do we know the Bible is authentic? Uh, 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 how do we know the Bible is accurate? How do we know the Bible is reliable? Where did it come from or how did it come to us? So we start talking about uh, the scriptures itself and then we kind of go into other aspects. But I think it's okay if we take, you know, maybe uh, another two or even three hours on this aspect of creation. Uh, so that we understand how to respond to questions that come our way. Okay, so thank you for uh, joining with me. I hope uh, you're, you know, you're, you're taking something back with you. Let's wrap up. Uh, I would request somebody just to close in prayer, please. Yeah, come on. Uh, I'll pray, Pastor. Father, yes, we thank you. Uh, thank you for what has been uh, taught, Father, as we ponder through uh, the scripture and uh, um, think through uh, these questions. Father, we pray that your spirit um, aligns us uh, to the understanding that we should know. Father, we thank you uh, for um, all that we could read through for your word and for all the knowledge for what has been taught. We we give you glory, Lord. Uh, we thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll come through this soon. Okay. God bless. Have a good day. Uh, not we're meeting again in 10 minutes. Okay. Bye now. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>